Hello everyone. This video is on section 10.2, part 2, titled Applications with Exponential Functions. So in this video, I'm going to be going over a version of the Newton-Alta assignment for section 10.2, part 2. Now please understand that the questions I see in this version may not be the same questions that you see when you do the assignment on your own. But the objectives are the same, the kinds of questions you'll see are similar, so I'm hoping that watching me do these few here will help you in some way when you work on the assignment yourself. All right. So here's the assignment page. Uh, you will not see the words preview of, or you're just going to see the title of the section, title of the assignment. And your mastery bar, right, showing you how far along you've gotten in the assignment. And this one's one of the longer ones, uh, has four objectives. And then under the current objective, you know, you'll have a question related to that objective. And at the bottom of every question, you should be seeing a feedback button, so you can send feedback to Newton if you wish. You will not see an instructor cheat button, right? this will not be there. But you will see a more instruction button. Right? Click on this if you are struggling with an objective and would like to see further reading material, maybe some videos related to that objective to hopefully help you out. Alright, so in this video, we're going to be dealing with uh, a lot of formulas involving, you know, bases and exponents, right, exponential functions. I am simply going to be writing the formulas I'm going to be using and explaining what the different variables mean. Uh, I'm not going to get into the development of the formulas, so please read your textbook or whatever, <laughs> whatever resource you have. Uh, on the development of these formulas if you wish, but I am simply going to be stating a formula that I'm going to be using and then using said formula to solve whatever question we're on. Okay, so this first question is on the objective use the compound interest formula to find the new value of an account. All right, so this is about the growth of money, you know, in an account uh, that, you know, accrues interest. So whether it be a loan, you know, an amount owed or an amount earned, right? All right, so I'll go to a page here where you, uh, I'll, first I'll read the question. So Allison accumulated seven thousand dollars in credit card debt. So this is the account amount at the moment. If the interest rate is 15 percent per year and she does not make any payments for three years, which is ridiculous, but like just just bear with the questions here. Don't think about how real they are. <laughs> how much will she owe on this debt in three years for quarterly compounding, and we're asked to round our answer to you know two decimal places, right? The nearest cent. So let's pull up a piece of paper here, and I want to write up for you the compound interest formula. Actually, there are going to be two of these. You'll see in a minute. All right. So the way I'm writing it is this way. I'm going to have A equals P multiplied by the quantity, and then here's the exponential statement, a, ba a base with an exponent. 1 plus R divided by n 
right, that quantity, 1 plus r over n, and then the exponent on this is n times t. There's the compound interest formula. Now I will explain what all these letters mean. So P is the principal amount. In other words, it's the initial amount of money in the account. That's the P. R is the yearly interest rate. The N is the number of times interest is compounded in a year. Again, I'm not going to get into all what all how, how you know it, what interest is. I'm not going to develop the formula here. Is uh, that takes that would take a while, and uh, I'm just I'm going to assume that you've read material on compound interest before watching this assignment video. So this n is the number of times interest is compounded in a year. The lowercase t is the time in years. It's the time in years. And finally, capital A, is the amount of money in the account after T years. So the amount in the account after the T years have passed. Okay, and I'll put this in a nice big box. And then I'm going to talk about this uh, this value of n. So when interest, you'll see some key words. When interest is compounded annually, That means that the value of n is 1. Right? That means uh, the interest is added to the account once a year. If they say semi-annually, that means it's done twice a year. Interest is added to the account, added to the account twice a year every six months. So the value of this n will be 2. Uh, if they say quarterly, like in the question I read, you know, the first question we're seeing here in the assignment, that means n equals 4. All right, interest is added to the account four times a year, every three months. Uh, then we could go monthly, just means that n equals 12, right, once a month, 12 times a year, interest is added. Weekly would mean that n equals 52, right, there are 52 weeks in a year, interest is added 52 times in a year. And I think the highest we're going to get is daily for this particular formula the value of n would be replaced by 365, right, 365 days. In a normal year, we'll talk about non-leap years here. All right. 
Now, we're going to eventually get to an objective where they talk about compounding interest continuously. If they say continuously, that means n is approaching infinity. Right? You're always adding interest. If that's the case, a different formula is used. All right, so not this formula here. Now it's a it's a it's a result from this. It comes from this formula. It's a limit of this formula, but you know I'm not going to talk about limits or anything here. But this is just just know that when you're talking about interest being compounded continuously, a different formula is used. for that case. All right, but for all these cases, all right, but for all when, when you compound interest a finite number of times, right, not infinite, then we're using this formula here uh, that I wrote up top. All right, so that's a lot. All right, that's a lot. That's why again, that's why I didn't really want to go into the development of it. That takes that take it would take even longer. All right, so let's bring up the, the question. You know, see, so you can read the question, and I'll, hopefully you can see the paper in the bottom here. Now it's going to be tiny for a little bit, tiny writing, but I'll, I'll make it bigger after we've read through the problem again. So notice it says, you know, I'll read through it again. We'll just give each of these numbers. We'll we'll we'll, we'll assign a value to p, r, n, t, and a. Well, we'll assign a value to four or five of these, right? Uh, for most of these, you'll know four of these values and have to find the fifth one. All right. So it says Allison accumulated seven thousand dollars in credit card debt. So that's the initial amount of debt. All right. So for this example, you know the value of P is seven thousand. Right, the, the initial amount of debt. Now it says if the interest rate is 15 percent, so remember that that was R the, the uh, per year, right? The annual interest rate R is 15 percent. Now don't forget that 15 percent is not 15. So don't replace R with 15. Remember what percent means. Percent means divided by a hundred. So I'm going to replace R with, you know, 15 divided by 100, or 0 0.15. Right, remember, when you divide by 100, it moves the decimal point to the left twice. So use this, right? Use 0 0.15. Don't use 15%. Right? Don't, well, don't use 15, but use 15%. Use 0.15. Uh, and then... Uh, you know, three years have passed, right? So that's the T, right? T was the time in years. So the value of T is three years. And it is mentioned for quarterly compounding. Right? And I told you about here, if you're compounding interest quarterly, that means interest is being added to the account, you know, is added to the debt four times a year the value of n, that lowercase n, is 4, right, because of quarterly. And now I have four of these values, I just want to find a. Right, so let me pull this, make this up, make this bigger again. So using the compound interest formula, we have the amount of debt after three years, right, a, is going to be the initial amount of debt, right, 7,000, times and then you have your exponential statement. In parentheses, it's 1 plus an r divided by n, 0.15, again, 0.15, not 15, divided by 4. All right, there's your r divided by n, and then that whole quantity raised to the n times t. Right? n is 4, and t is 3. And they ask us to round this value to two decimal places. 
And I'm just going to enter this the way it looks in uh, my graphing calculator. Right, now you can go to the Desmos website if you wish, but uh, I do have a TI-84 emulator here. And yeah, I'm going to enter this exactly as it looks on my calculator. So uh, We have 7,000 times, and then the quantity, parentheses, 1 plus 0.15, right, the R divided by N, R divided, uh, 0.15 divided by 4, close the parentheses, and then raise to the, and then, you know, 4 times 3 is 12, so the exponent's just going to be 12, right, 12th power. So it's 10,000, right, this is approximately, this is dollars, right, 10,000, 888 dollars, and you know, 18 cents, because you know, round to two decimal places, 180 would just round to 18. This is how much debt would be owed by uh, Allison, I believe the name was. This is how much debt would be owed after three years, you know, if if Allison didn't make any payments at all you know, on the debt for three years. And that's what I'm going to uh, enter. Back in the assignment. So 10,888.18. Great. And after every question, you know, whether you get it right or wrong, there is an answer explanation. Please read through this, um, whether you got it right or wrong. You now, if you got it correct, read through it to make sure you got it right for the right reasons. You know that you didn't just get lucky or you know guess and get lucky. Or you know they they may go over an alternate method, and uh, you might like that alternate method better and use it in future questions that are similar. Now, if you got it wrong definitely read through the answer explanations and try to figure out why you were wrong and learn from your mistakes. All right, next question. All right, so this is on properties of exponentials, right? And I'll write this property out for you. Let's use the one-to-one -one property of exponential equations to solve an exponential equation. All right, so I'm going to make a statement about bases and exponents, this one-to-one -one property, and then we'll use it, along with further properties of exponents. Right. So first I'm going to write this one-to-one -one property for exponents for you. So if you have a base b to, say, the power m, and that's equal to an expression with the same base but to the power of n? Well, the only way that can happen, you know, b to the m equal to b to the n, the only way that can happen is if the exponents are the same if m is equal to n. Right, so this is, this is called, you know, the one-to-one -one property for exponents. Right? So our goal in these equations is going to be to get an equation that looks like this, where I have the same base on both sides to a single power. So the example they're giving us here is, you know, e to the x squared divided by e to the second. When is this equal? to e to the negative x. Right. So I have to use some properties of exponents here. Because right. this does not look like this, first off. I want one base to one power on both sides. That is not happening here. But I can use a property of exponents. We have e to the x squared 
divided by e to the second. Remember, when you divide things with the same base, you can keep that base and then subtract their powers to get a new power. So this is e, this left side is now e to the x squared minus 2 power equals, and then the right side is already the way I want it, it's a single base to a single power, e to the negative x power there. And now, now I can use this one-to-one -one property, because both sides are the same base, base e, to a single power. So now I'm using, you know, by the one-to-one -one property, You know, the only way two expressions with base e are going to be equal is if their exponents are equal. Right? I just set the exponents equal to each other. So x squared minus 2, right, the exponent on the left side, must be equal to the exponent on the right side, which was negative x. And now I'm solving this. Right? And this is a quadratic equation. Uh, take, you know, I'm going to add x to both sides. We have x squared plus x minus 2 equals 0. And we can use the quadratic formula if you wish, but this is nice and factorable. This factors to x plus 2 times x minus 1. And then we use the zero product property here. The solutions, po the possible solutions are x equals negative 2, and that would make that factor 0, or x equals 1, and then don't forget to check these solutions. Now, if I'm telling you right now, because the domain of an exponential function is all real numbers, if you're doing this correctly, uh, any solution you find should work. But let's just test it out. Now, if I replace x with negative 2, back in the original equation, this would be e to the fourth power, divided by e squared would be e squared. And then the right side would also be e squared. You'd have e squared equals e squared. This works. This makes it true. And then when x is 1, you'd have e to the first divided by e squared to be e to the negative first equals e to the negative first. Uh, that works out as well. So the solutions to this equation are uh, negative 2 and positive 1 for x. Those make the original true. But, but this is what they mean by using the 1 to 1 property. You're trying to set the equation up so that both sides are expressions with the same base to a single power. Right? Which again, the way it started off didn't look like that, but I used properties of exponents to make it look like that. And then we apply the one-to-one -one property, solve and check. All right, so back in the assignment, now it does say enter all solutions separated by commas. So x equals, you know, I said the solutions were negative two, comma, and positive one. Great. And, you know, as I said before, please read through your answer explanations. Okay, continuing on. Alright, so here we're asked to calculate resultant values using exponential growth and decay models. Alright, um, so I'm going to put up what does an exponential growth and decay model look like. Alright, All right, so, so far as with other questions, I'm just going to write out the model we're using, the equation, the formula we're using, and uh, you know, explain what it, what, what parts of it mean. So the model we're using for exponential growth and decay is the following exponential function. So a of t, right, just like function notation, f of, you know, it's like f of t, f of x, g of x, whatever, equals a sub 0 times e to the r times t power. Okay, where r 
is you know the growth or decay rate and I'll tell you right now if if R is greater than zero if R is positive it's called a growth rate if R is negative if R is less than zero it's called a, a decay rate the, the, the population or whatever will be decreasing. T is time. Now the time could be in days, in months, in years, in seconds. You know, it depends on what's in the question. A sub zero. Right, this a sub zero number in front of the e to the rt is the initial amount of whatever substance we're talking about. Right, the amount at time zero, right, a sub zero. And then finally a of t, or just a if you want to call it just a, is the amount after t, or just the amount at time t. the amount of people, the amount of whatever at time t. Okay. Now I'll put this in a little box here, a little bubble. Yet another equation that you're going to need to remember or just pull up you know, when you need to use it. Okay, so just like before, I'm going to put the work up here so we can see the question. Now reading through this, right, it says, in the last year the population of Japan had, dec had a decay rate of 0.17%. So remember, like, like with the interest rate from the compound interest problem earlier, I'm not going to use 0.17 for R. I'm going to use 0 0.0017, right? This is 0.17%. and decreased to 127,484,450 people. If this rate continues, uh, what will be the population in seven more years? And round your answer to the nearest whole number. All right. So we're given the, the, the rate here, right, so our example. Now they said it was a decay rate. Right, the population is decreasing. Since they said it was a decay rate, I'm going to make R a negative number. If they said it was a growth rate, I'd have R be a positive number. And it was negative 0.17%. So once again, don't use 0.17, negative 0.17. I'm going to use negative 0.0017 for the value of r. All right. That's going to go here in the exponent of my model. The initial amount is given. All right. We're given a, we're given a population right now. All right. The population is you know 127 million 484,000 450 people at the moment and we're asked to then find what's the population after seven years right in seven more years so t equals seven and time and time will be in years here All right, so let's go back so the the amount of people in the city in Japan or whatever yeah the population of Japan after seven years will follow you know this model here will be you know 127 million 484,450 times e raised to the and then the the exponent is r times t now remember the rate is negative being a decay rate negative 0 0.0017 right the negative 0.17 percent but don't write 0.17 right it's 0.17 percent so move the decimal place to the left twice times seven 
right, the amount of years that have passed. And remember, E is a number, right? Hopefully you recall from a previous video that E is approximately 2.718, something like that, right? Um, so, again, I'm going to go to a calculator and just enter this, and they ask us to round our answer to the nearest whole number, right? Because it's a population, uh, people. So pulling up a calculator, and I'll just be entering this expression, you know, as it looks in my calculator. So you have 127 million, 484,450 times, and then e, e, right, raised to the negative point zero zero one seven times seven power. Just make sure that's all in the exponent on E, right? The base of E has this exponent. And enter. And rounding to the nearest whole number, right? This is approximately one hundred twenty five million nine hundred seventy six thousand. 375.9 would round up to 376 people. And this is what I'll be entering uh, in my assignment. So I'm getting rid of the calculator here, going back to the assignment. And the round of the nearest all number say so, so I have seven years later, if the the K rate stays the way it is. Uh, the population of Japan should be 125 million, 976,376. And that should be good. Wonderful. Right. So again, I, I've written up the model there. You know, A of T equals A sub zero times E to the RT. You just have to know what to fill in where. And they're doing that all down here as well. Right. Okay. And uh, next question. So another one on that same objective. Calculate the resultant values using exponential growth and decay models. So I'm using that same model. Right, we're using this model here again and just filling in whatever numbers and, and again paying attention to units and whatnot making sure units match up that's always important all right so this time it says in the last six years the population of San Francisco has grown at a rate of 1.26 percent per year to 870,887 if this rate continues, what will be the population in five more years? So my the the amount we're talking about now is 870,887 people. The growth rate is 1.26%. Right? Now it's growth, so this will be positive 0 0.0126. And then we're talking five more years later. Five, you know, starting from now, five more years passing, so t is going to be five. All right, so again, I'll pull this up so you can see the question. And we're using the same model, right, same model here. And the growth rate, right, R is equal to, and they said it was a growth rate. So that means I'm going to keep this positive, 1.26%. In other words, 0 0.0126, right? This is what I'll be using for R. The initial amount, or the amount of the population that we're starting with here is the 870,887 people. And the time passing is five years. I said, what will be the population in five more years? So t equals five. All right, and then we'll go make that bigger. And so putting all this together, we get the amount of people after five years, a of five will be, you know, the that that initial amount, the amount now, eight hundred seventy thousand people, or eight hundred seventy thousand, eight hundred eighty-seven people, times 
e to the rt, and r is 0 0.0126, t is 5, right, 5 years passing, and again, this, this is what I'm going to enter into my calculator. So we have the, the initial amount, 870,887 people times, and then e to the point zero one two six, right, positive point zero one two six. It was a growth rate, not a decay rate, times five. And again, make sure that the, uh, five years passing, and make sure that that's all in the exponent on the base of e. Enter, and we're asked to round to the nearest person, right, the nearest whole number. So this is 927,000, 518.0, you know, so 518, right, people. That would be the nearest person. So five years later, if that growth rate continued, the 870,000 whatever people would grow into 927,518 people. Right, so once again, let's, uh, let's go back to the assignment and enter that. 927, 518. Right. Yeah, same model. Right. Just pay attention to the objective, right? If you read the, whatever objective you're working on will indicate to you what property or what, what equation, what formula, what model you're using. Right. Next question. All right, so I mentioned this way earlier uh, in the video, right? Uh, we talked about the compound interest formula. And, you know, I said if you were compounding annually, semi-annually, quarterly, monthly, daily, whatever, there was a value for n, right? That lowercase n in the formula. But then when we get to compounding continuously, that value of n is supposedly going to infinity. So a totally new formula is needed for this particular this objective. Right? So use the continuously compounding interest formula to find the new value of an account. Right, so you saw this again. You saw this earlier. The regular compound interest formula. You know when n was a finite number. But when you're compounding interest continuously. You know, the value of n is approaching infinity, you're going to have to use the following formula. Right, so here it is, the continuously compounding interest formula. The amount in the account after t years will be equal to p, right, the principal, all these letters still mean the same thing as when we had compound interest, p times e to the RT power. So it's very similar to the exponential growth model. Right? The amount after T time T is equal to some initial amount times E to the rate times time. Yeah. This is the you know, continuous. So notice there's no N here, right? N is, N is infinity, that's not a number. There's no N in this formula. And all the letters mean the same thing as before with the regular interest formula, right, compound interest formula. You have P is the principal or the initial amount. A is the amount after T years. T is the time in years. And R is the annual interest rate. Right. So for example, right, and I'll just keep referring back to this page now when we work on this objective. So back to the problem. They're saying here, you know, Cynthia invested $12,000 in a savings account. So that's the initial amount. That's the principal, the P. If the interest rate is 6%, now don't forget you're not using 6, right? You're using 6%, 0 0.06 for R. How much will be in the account in 10 years by compounding continuously and round to the nearest cent, right? Two decimal places. Right, so keep that keep that question up. You can see the question, and then yeah, I'm just you know I'm filling in 
P, R, and T and finding A. Right. The principal, the initial amount was the $12,000 that she invested, Cynthia invested. The interest rate was 6% per year. But remember, I'm not using 6, we're using 6%, you know, 0.06. .06. Don't forget to change that. And then the time passed is 10 years. Right, and time's got to be in years, right? so t equals 10. So putting all that together, and now I'll make this a little bigger. Putting all this together, we have the amount in the savings account after 10 years. It's going to be 12,000, right, the principal, the initial amount, times e to the RT, right, e to the 0 0.06 times 10, right, RT. And I'm going to punch this into a calculator once again and round to the nearest cent, right, round to two decimal places. So once again, pulling up a calculator. Let's clear that. So 12,000, right, the initial amount, times e to the 0 0.06 times 10, or just 0.6 if you want, right, 0 0.06 times 10 is just 0.6. So after 10 years, right, if she didn't add any more money to it and didn't, just left it alone, there would be 21,000. eight hundred and sixty five dollars and forty two forty three cents you know if you round to the nearest cent because it's point four two five which would round up to point four three and this is what we'll be entering in the assignment twenty one thousand eight hundred sixty five dollars and forty three cents right, so let's do that going back to the assignment Twenty one thousand eight hundred sixty five dollars point four three. Great. So, yeah, so again, when you see this objective referring to continuously compounding interest, you're using that formula A equals P times E to the RT power. Right, so now I have all the formulas and properties written out that we're going to need for each objective. So again, I'm just going to pay attention to what objective I'm working on and then refer to the, the, the corresponding formula or model I need. All right, next question. So it's that same objective. Use the continuously compounding interest formula to find the new value of an account. All right, so once again, I'm back question up. I'm back on this page with the continuously compounding interest formula. I'm just doing a new question. Right. So here it says uh, Peter accumulated $7,500 in credit card debt. So that's the initial amount of debt, right? That's going to be the value of P. Right, $7,500. The interest rate R is 3.5% per year, so 0 0.035. Don't forget to do that. Move the decimal place to the left twice. You're doing percent. Right. And if he does not make any payments for 10 years, right? so T is 10, how much will he owe on this debt in 10 years by compounding continuously? Right, so you know, I'll make this a little bigger. So the amount of debt he'll owe, you know, if he doesn't pay anything off in 10 years, which is ridiculous, but will be the initial amount of debt, right, the 7,500, times e to the RT, right, to the 0 0.035, that was the 3.5%, times T, the 10 years. Or you could just put 0.35, right, 0 0.035 times 10 is 0.35. And we're asked to round this to, again, the nearest cent. So another time, I'm pulling up a calculator. 
and we're doing seventy-five hundred dollars times e to the point three five. All right, that's point zero three five times ten point three five. So if he didn't, you know, if he just left it alone and let the interest build up, you know, he'd owe ten thousand six hundred forty-three dollars and uh, one cent. Right, zero zero six would round up to zero zero one, or sorry, zero one. Point zero zero six would round up to point zero one. So to the new, uh, so you owe ten thousand six hundred forty-three dollars and one cent. Okay, and that's what I'll enter. Ten thousand six hundred forty-three dollars and one cent. Point zero one. Great. Okay, next question. Alright, so we're back to using that one-to-one -one property of exponential equations. So I'll pull that back up. Alright, I wrote that page out. And we're solving the equation, you know, 3 to the 2x minus 1 power equals 27. All right, so here is that one-to-one -one property for exponents again. This time we're given this equation, right, 3 to the 2x minus 1 power equals 27. Now notice this does not look like this first part of the, you know, the hypothesis of the one-to-one -one property. I want both sides to have the same base to a single power. So this side has base 3. This side has base 27. But hopefully you see that you know 27 is a power of 3. So this is the same thing as 3 to the 2x minus 1 power on the left equals 3 to the third power. Right? That's 27. Now I can apply the one-to-one -one property, right? Both sides are the same base to an exponent. So now I can apply this one-to-one -one property. And if, if two expressions with the same base are equal, then their exponents must be equal. So I'm just equating the exponents. 2x minus 1 must be equal to 3. And then adding 1, dividing by 2, x then must be equal to 2. And don't forget to check that. Right? If I replace x with 2, you know, 2 times 2 is 4, minus 1 is 3. 3 of the third power is indeed 27. So, and that is the only solution here, right? the number 2 for x. So x equals 2. Simple as that. And again, please read through your answer explanations. All right, so now we're back to the objective on just the compound interest formula to find the new value of an account. So here we go. I'll pull this up. Now you can see the question up top. Let me pull. Let me pull that compound interest formula page back. All right, here's that there. Right, the compound interest formula. A equals P times the quantity 1 plus R over N to the NT power, where, again, I wrote out what all those letters mean. And let's read through the question and fill in these letters. So Nazari, I'm definitely not pronouncing that right, Nazari deposits $8,000 in a certificate of deposit, right, a, C, a CD or COD, right? usually just CD. That's the initial amount in this certificate of deposit, in this CD. So that's the principal, right? 8,000. That's the P. The annual interest rate is 6%, right? So R is 6%, which I'm gonna write as, you know, 0.06, right? Not just six, but six divided by 100. And the interest will be compounded quarterly. So again, quarterly, that means N equals four, right? The number of times interest is added in a year 
is 4 times. That's the value of that lowercase n. How much will the certificate be worth in 10 years? So the time passed t, the lowercase t, is 10. So I have all I need now to be able to find the amount in this certificate of deposit after 10 years. All right, so let's bring this up. So putting all this together, we have the amount in the certificate is the principal, P, right, the 8,000, multiplied by the quantity, 1 plus 0 0.06 over 4, all right, that's the base, raised to the n times t power, the 4 times 10 power, or the 40th power. And that's what I'll enter in my calculator and we'll round to the two decimal places, right, round to the nearest cent. So I'm going to pull the calculator up here. So I got 8,000 times the quantity 1 plus then the interest rate 0.06, 6% divided by the you know compounded quarterly, 4 times a year, the value of n and all that raised to the 40th power, right, 40, 4 times 10, n times t. So after 10 years, uh, the amount in the certificate with all the interest added would be about $14,512.15 if I round to the nearest cent, right, 0.147 would round up to 0.15. And that's why I'll enter fourteen thousand five hundred twelve and fifteen cents. Okay. Wonderful. All right, moving on. So back to that one to one property. So let me pull that page back. There it is. And, uh, you know, we're asked to solve this equation. 6 to the negative 3x minus 1 power equals 36. So again, these sides don't have the same base to some power, so I can't apply the one-to-one -one property. But I hope you recognize that 36 is a power of 6. So I can very easily write both sides with a base of 6. Right, The left side is still 6 to the negative 3x minus 1, and the right side I can express as 6 squared. All right, that's 36, 6 to the second. And then applying that one-to-one -one property, I'm just going to write a double arrow here, both sides have a base of 6, and they're equal. So they must have the same exponent, right, according to that one-to-one -one property. So negative 3x minus 1 must be equal to 2. And then that means that negative 3x must be equal to 3. x must be equal to negative 1, dividing both sides by negative 3 there. And don't forget to check. All right, when I plug in negative 1 for x, this would be 6 to the second power, which is 36. It works. So the only solution here is negative 1. Great. All right, and then again, read through the answer explanations, please. All right, next question. All right, still on that 1 to 1 property just a, a different equation to solve. And this is just like the first question I did with this objective, where I have to, you know, both sides have bases of E, but the left side is not a single base of E to a single power. I need to use a property of exponents to write it that way. Right, so the equation this time is, you know, E to the x squared power divided by e to the 5x power. 
that's equal to e to the 14th. All right, so once again, this equation, the way it looks, is not in this form, in the one-to-one -one property. Right? I want both sides to have the same base to a single power. That is not happening on the left here. But I can use properties of exponents. This is e to the x squared minus 5x power. Right, remember, when you divide two things with the same base, you keep that base and subtract the exponents. And now I have what I want. Both sides are, are have a base of e to a single power. And right, then I'm going to apply that one-to-one -one property. Right, since both sides have a base of e, their exponents must be the same. So x squared minus 5x, right, the exponent on the left side, must be equal to the exponent on the right side, must be equal to 14. And then I'm solving this quadratic equation. So we have x squared minus 5x, then minus 14 would be equal to 0. And you could use the quadratic formula here if you wish, uh, but this is nice and factorable. This factors to x minus 7 times x plus 2. And so the possible solutions are positive 7 and negative 2. Right? x equals positive 7 or x equals negative 2, and don't forget to check them. Now if I put 7 in, you'd have e to the 49th divided by e to the 35th, that would be e to the 14th for sure, so that works. And then when I put negative 2 in, you'd have e to the 4th divided by e to the negative 10th, which would be, you know, put them together, be e to the 14th using properties of exponents. So they, they both work. They both work. They both make the original statement a true statement. So the solutions are 7 and negative 2, which we are to separate by commas. 7, comma, negative 2, or negative 2, comma, 7, it doesn't matter. Great. All right, so that objective with the one-to-one -one property is done. You can get rid of that page. All right, so now we're on the, <coughs> pardon me, back to the compound interest formula objective. And here's the, here's the thing where you can see the question. Here's that compound interest formula page I wrote up earlier. And we're just, you know, filling in certain values. You know, I need to know P, R, and N, and T. And then I can find A. All right, so this is an, another debt one, right? Edgar accumulated $5,000 in credit card debt. So that's the initial amount of debt. That's the principal. Right? P is 5000 the interest rate is 20% per year, so R equals 0.2. Right, that's 20%, 0 0.2. Does not make payments for two years. Right? T equals 2. Right? Time passed is two years. How much will he owe on this debt in two years for monthly compounding? So the value of N here is 12, right? monthly compounding added interest interest was added 12 times a year once a month so we have all the information we need now to find the amount of debt after these two years so putting all these together we get the amount of debt he'd owe after two years would be the initial amount of debt right the 5,000 times the quantity 1 plus r over n, 0 0.2 divided by 12. And then all that raised to the nt, 2 times 12. Right. Or to the 24th power. I'll just enter 24 in the calculator for the exponent. All right, so I'll pull a calculator up. And we'll enter this expression. So I have 5,000 times the quantity 1 plus 0 0.2, the 20% interest rate divided by 12, right, that's compounded monthly. And that base there, that thing in parentheses, raised to the 24th power, right, 2 times 12, n times t. So after the two years, he'd owe approximately, you know, $7,434 
and 57 cents if I'm rounding to the nearest cent. $7,434.57. And so that is what I will be entering in the assignment. Wonderful. All right, continuing on. All right, so this is looks like this is going to be the, this is going to be the last question on this objective, right? Once again, the just the plain old compound interest formula, not the continuously compounding interest formula. Be be aware of the difference. Uh, same thing, right? So I'll pull up the question with the compound interest formula page that I wrote up earlier. And we'll write out all the information that's necessary. So it says Terra deposits $5,000 in a CD, right, a certificate of deposit. So that's the initial amount in the certificate, 5000 P is 5000 The annual interest rate, R, is 7%, which I'll write as, you know, 0.07, right, that's 7%. And the interest will be compounded quarterly, so n equals 4 again, right? We've seen quarterly before. The interest is added 4 times in a year. And how much will the certificate be worth in 10 years? So t equals 10, right? And round your answer to two decimal places, right? The nearest cent. So putting all this together into the formula, the amount that will be in this certificate after 10 years will be 5,000, right? The initial amount times the quantity 1 plus r over n, 0 0.07 over 4, raised to the nt power, 4 times 10 power, or the 40th power is what I'm going to enter in the calculator. All right, so once again, I'm pulling up a calculator, and we're entering this expression. So we have 5,000. times the quantity 1 plus 0.07 divided by 4, close parentheses, raised to the 4 times 10 power, right, the 40th power. So after 10 years, this certificate would have approximately $10,007.00. And 99 cents, if I round to the two decimal places there, $10,007.99 after the 10 years. Right, so again, back to the assignment, and that's what I'll be entering. $10,007.99. Great. All right, so that objective's done. So I'm done with the, the plain old compound interest formula. Get rid of that page. Right, and the next question is on the exponential growth and decay model page. Right, I wrote those out earlier. All right, so once again, I'll have the question up here, and you can see the exponential growth and decay model. That was that you know, amount after t, after time t is equal to the initial amount, right, a sub 0 times e to the rt, where r is the growth rate if it's positive, decay rate if it's negative, and t is the time, right, how much time has passed. All right, then I'll blank page, um, read through this, right, now it says in the last five years the population, this is like the population of Japan problem earlier, population of Germany has grown at a rate of 0.62%, right? So the rate, now they did say it was growth. So that means positive, right? Positive, this is gonna be a positive rate. 0.62%, which I'll write as 0 0.0062. All right, that's 0.62%, don't forget. Uh, has grown at a rate of 0.62% per year to 82 million 800,000. So that's the amount we're starting with here in this problem. The amount of people initially in this problem in Germany is 82 million 800,000. 
if this rate continues, what will be the population in five more years? So the time passing that we're concerned with is five years, so t equals five. And this is enough to, you know, get the population estimate in, in five years. And we're asked to round to the nearest whole number, right, the nearest person. All right, so putting these all together, right, the amount of people in five years, A of five, would be 82,800,000, all right, that's the A sub zero, the initial, the population now, times E to the RT, right, to the 0 0.0062 times five. And I'll, this, this is what I'll be entering in my calculator, this expression, and rounding to the nearest person. So eighty two million eight hundred thousand times and then e to the point oh six two times five power point oh oh six two times five and make sure that's all in the exponent point oh oh six two times five. All right, so after five years, if this rate continued, the approximate population of Germany would be 85 million, 406, uh, 407,000 people. All right, because uh, you have 999 and then 0.7 would bump that up to 407,000 people. And that's what's going to be entered in the assignment. So eighty five million four hundred and seven thousand. Great. Okay. Continuing on. All right, so one more question here involving the exponential growth slash decay model. Let me once again pull up the work here where you can see the question up top and you see my page here with the exponential growth and decay model and we're just going to fill in the pertinent information while reading through. So here a scientist is studying the growth and development of an epidemic virus with a decay rate. So R, right, but they told us it was a decay rate. So this is going to be negative, negative got to be a negative number if it's a decay rate, a decreasing rate of, of 21%. So negative 0 0.21, right? Negative 21% decay rate. Now this time, time is in months, right? It's 21% per month. So let's make sure all the things are consistent. Notice it's giving me time in months and stuff like that, right? Um, has infected 781,563 people. That's the initial amount of infected people. 781,000. So that'll be the A sub zero, the initial amount of infected people that we're starting with. And we're asked to figure out how many people would be infected then if this rate continues, right? If this decay rate continues, what will be the number of infected people in another 30 months? Now it should be decreasing, right? They said it was a decay rate and time is equal to 30, you know, this is months. And we're asked to round this to the nearest whole number. All right, so once again, going back, making this a little bigger. So the amount of people infected after 30 months would be the initial amount, right, the amount we have starting with, you know, 781,563 uh, times e to the rt, so negative, right, decay rate, negative 0.21 times t, right, times 30, okay, which is uh, negative 6.3, so just to save some time, I'll just type in negative 6.3 uh, in the calculator. So again, I'm going to the calculator and entering this expression. So 
So we have uh, 781,563 times e to the negative 6.3 power, right? That was that was the negative 0.21 times 30. And we're asked to round this to the nearest person, right? The nearest whole number. So, you know, again, it's decreasing at this rate. Only about 1,435 people would be infected after 30 months of this. Right. One, oh, that's, the, that's the nearest whole number. All right, so let's get rid of this stuff. And back in the assignment, we're entering approximately 1,435. Great. All right, so the only objective left is on that continuously compounding interest. Right, and I should have just two more questions involving that. All right, so once again, I'll bring up the question here so you can see the question and my continuously compounding interest formula page. We just got to fill in the pertinent information. So that's that A equals P times E to the RT. Right? P is the initial amount of money, R is the annual interest rate, T is the time in years, and A is the final amount after T years. Right? All right, so here, reading through, we have Klaus invested $8,000 in a savings account. So that's the initial amount of money in the savings account, the principal. So P equals 8,000. The interest rate is 3.45% annually, right? So R is 0 0.0345, right? That's 3.45% written as a decimal. How much will be in the account in 15 years? So T is 15, right? Time is in years here for the interest formulas. By compounding continuously, right? Notice that compounding continuously, that means that n is infinity, right? The formula does not have n involved at all. So this is enough. We just need p and r and t to be able to answer this question. All right. So putting this all together, we have the amount in the savings account after 15 years would be 8,000 times e to the rt, right? So point, uh, zero, three, four, five. times, you know, 15, and make sure that's all in the the exponent, right, and that's what I'm going to enter in my calculator. So let's bring up the calculator. So we have the initial amount of money invested, 8,000 times, and then, you know, we're compounding continuously, so I'm using this e to the rt formula, e to the point zero three four five times fifteen all in the exponent right make sure that's all in the exponent on that base of e so after about fifth after fifteen years there'd be approximately you know thirteen thousand four hundred twenty two dollars and sixty two cents if you round to the nearest cent in this savings account all right so let's go back and enter that Thirteen thousand four hundred twenty-two and sixty-two point six two. Wonderful. And there should just be one more here. Again, I'm using this co continuously compounding interest formula, and I'm going to be entering stuff into the formula and then entering into a calculator. Right, so again, I'll bring the question up with the continuously compounding interest formula page here and we just need to know the pertinent information so another savings account problem right Quinn invested eighty eighty five hundred dollars so the principal here is eight thousand five hundred dollars the value of P the interest rate is two point nine eight percent written as a decimal would be zero point zero two nine eight so that'll be the value of R, 0 0.0298. And how much will be the, in the account in 12 years, right? T equals 12. And that's all you need, right? There's no N when you're compounding continuously, right? N is infinity, um, which is not a number. And then we're going to round to the nearest cent. Right, so going back, let's bring that back up. 
So the amount in the savings account after 12 years will be 8,500. Right, the initial amount times e to the rt, 0 0.0298 times 12, right, that exponent. Right, so that's the expression I'm going to be entering in my calculator. Bring the calculator back. So we have 8,500 times e to the 0 0.0298 times 12 power. Make sure that's all in the exponent. And the amount in this savings account will be approximately $12,154.10 if I round to the nearest cent. And that's what I'll enter in, this, in the assignment. The amount will be about $12,154, and the nearest cent would be 10 cents. Wonderful. All right, again, please read through your answer explanations, and as I said throughout the video, right, this particular one with the applications, you just have to pay attention to what objective you're working on. What objective is the question about? Um, so you know which model, which equation, which formula, which property to be using, right? There were four of them. There was the compound interest formula, the continuously compound interest formula, the exponential growth and decay model, and then that one-to-one -one property for exponents. I just kept bouncing back and forth between those. All right, and that should be it for this assignment, this version of this assignment. Um, now as I said at the top of the video, right, please know that the questions I saw here may not be the same questions you see, um, but the objectives are the same. The types of questions should be similar. So I'm hoping that watching me go through these, these 16 questions in this particular video help you out in some way when you're working on the assignment on your own. All right, and thank you very much for watching.